What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to BDGE Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas. I hope y'all are having a very, 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 very nice day. I know these are very odd times. Some of the worst times our country's probably ever seen. We're not here to get into politics or anything, but I do feel like as someone who has somewhat of, of a platform, it would be not ignorant, but it, it would be something I would regret not touching on the topic of uh, in terms of the protests and stuff that are going on. And I did so in the new podcast that I just launched today called Why You Yelling? The first episode is titled George Floyd Matters. And I give my thoughts on what's happening around our country right now, not proposing a solution or anything, but just my general thoughts, the way I feel about it, because it's weighing heavily on my heart. And I think it, it, I would be remiss not to mention what, what's happening in the world right now uh, when I'm here just talking about fantasy football. Obviously, way more important things going on, but hopefully I can kind of pull you guys back from the seriousness of everything that's going on and, and help you guys enjoy life a little bit for a small period of time with me this morning. So this morning, we will be getting back into my wide receiver rankings. We did the first four last week, and if you missed them, it went Michael Thomas as the wide receiver one, Devontae Adams as the two, I want to say Tyreek as the three, and Julio as the four. I might have flipped the three and four, but regardless, that was the first tier, and I wanted to do five through ten in this video. However, there were a few guys I was unsure about in terms of my analysis because I haven't talked to Dr. Morse yet this offseason. He will be coming on the channel on Thursday, so that will help me get into a few more guys that I was a little bit unsure of, right? We have the Kenny Galladay's, the Amari Coopers. We want to know about the injuries that happened to Matt Stafford. Is Cooper's foot ever going to be okay? Like there were a lot of guys that I was kind of unsure about in that next tier that I wanted to make sure I had the best analysis for y'all before I started doing all the rankings and stuff. So today we're going to break down five through eight or five through seven in, in very deep depth. These are guys that I think hold a lot of polarizing analysis behind them for 2020 fantasy football. So today, wide receiver rankings, five through seven. Hit the button that looks like that if you enjoy. Tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. Stop yelling. Bah, bah. And let's eat. So my wide receiver five in 2020 fantasy football. Drum roll, please. Let me know who your wide receiver five is. I'm curious because this is going to be a very, a very good debate throughout the offseason. My wide receiver five, it's not DeAndre Hopkins. It's not Kenny Galladay. It's not DJ Moore. Chris Godwin, my wide receiver five, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, currently going off the board at 209 as the wide receiver six. The dude is just a fucking stud. And I don't see a world where Brady and Godwin don't mesh beautifully. Like all last summer, Godwin was pretty much propped up as the biggest breakout candidate at the wide receiver's position in fantasy football like you heard it left and right anyone who was talking about breakout wide receivers Godwin was atop the list but not just from the fantasy perspective like Bruce Arians was the one hyping him up the entire summer right and Bruce Arians is not mince words he's talking shit about Jameis Winston he gone I mean you just look at what Arians was saying about him last year he can be close to a 100 catch guy we want him to play the Larry Fitzgerald role Jason Lick loved him Chris Godwin will never come off the field. So Arians is saying he's going to play the Larry Fitzgerald role. He's never going to come off the field. He's going to catch 100 passes. So what happens? Godwin plays on 95% of the snaps last year, runs from the slot on 63% of his routes, catches 86 passes in 14 games. If you pace that out to a full 16, guess what? That's 98 receptions. And one of those games was a half a game. So realistically, he would have been at the 100 catch mark. Word for word, it matched exactly what Arians said. And then he's come out this offseason saying that Chris Godwin getting his extension is the highest priority of the team. That means he is going to be so integrated into this game game plan going forward for the next few years so you look back at those numbers the 14 game numbers if you pace them out to 16 we're looking at 137 targets 98 receptions 1523 receiving yards 10.3 touchdowns now the big move here of course is tom brady coming to tampa bay this does not concern me whatsoever for a lot of reasons if there's anyone to be concerned about in my opinion it's mike evans and we'll probably get to him in next video or the video after that or whatever but we're here to talk about chris godwin and why this does not concern me you look at godwin just as a player again his pff receiving grade number two only behind michael thomas last year right ahead of julio who was the number three number nine in yards per route run despite being 49th in average depth of target he was fourth in yards per target the guys that were ahead of him in yards per target mike williams stefan diggs aj brown all of those guys the average depth of target was way 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 downfield compared to chris godwin so the fact that he can fix that delta between average depth of target and rank so highly in yards per target is what makes him such a fucking baller and the reason he can turn low yardage targets into 
high yards per target number is because he's very good after the catch yards after catch per reception third in the entire nfl now everyone's worried about brady's deep ball right his arm blah blah it's a fucking noodle at this point he's fine for what you need from chris godwin tom brady he played with an embarrassing group of weapons last year so i don't really understand how you expected him to be good and who was he going to be passing the ball down the field to like he can't take deep strikes at julian edelman every drive despite all the nonsense last year still finished seventh in passing yards 13th in passing touchdowns his deep ball completion percentage was ninth in the nfl per player profile Profiler. Even an average quarterback would make Godwin an elite fantasy option running from the slot. Even if you don't think Brady's going to be good at throwing the ball down the field, that's fine because he relies on these short, quick hitting passes, and that is where Godwin fucking eats. He's going to be the first read for Tom Brady basically every time. It doesn't matter what you think about Tom Brady's deep ball because that's not, again, where Chris Godwin made his money. Only 14.9% of his targets came on deep passes, which was 76th out of 96 qualified wide receivers. Evans, on the other hand, again, is the guy who would get more hurt by this. His deep target percentage was 8% higher than Chris Godwin. So 8% more of his targets came down the field as opposed to Godwin, where his average at the target, again, was way, 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 way pulled back. Sure, they won't throw for 5,000 yards, and they might run a little bit more, right? They're not going to be as prolific in the passing game as they were with Winston last year, but the offense is going to have the ball more. They're going to be more efficient. They're going to run more overall plays, run more smoothly down the field, and be a lot more efficient in the red zone. There are probably more touchdowns to be had down there. So case in point, I just think Brady, even at his limited talent level right now, which I don't think is as bad as most people make it out to, be is a perfect perfect match for Chris Godwin we've seen what he's done for slot receivers and as I said last year Godwin operated as you're getting that Larry Fitzgerald role where Larry Fitzgerald dominated as like a 31 32 33 years old you're getting Chris Godwin in the absolute prime of his career right now running that same route tree and that same snap percentage from the slot which is so fucking valuable in fantasy football in his prime like that's all I gotta say like draft very good young players entering their prime it, it doesn't get much more simple than that so Chris Godwin my wide receiver five we get to DeAndre Hopkins as the wide receiver six Arizona Cardinals current ADP he is the 205 so he's going early to mid second round he is the wide receiver four off the board actually getting picked before Julio Jones this is just pretty simple and I tweeted this out asking you know if anyone's done any studies on whether or not wide receivers or players in general just tend to kind of tank their fantasy production and their value going to a new team whether that's through free agency or whether that's through trade it seems like common sense that they were going to take a dive and I think people are kind of just overlooking it because they're like oh it's DeAndre Hopkins it's a fun offense to be a part of for for, for a passing weapons and I got like a million responses there was Scott Barrett who did a deep dive on it there was Addison Hayes of, of DLF there were uh, Rotoviz articles like there are so I'll, I'll put some of the articles on the screen or I'll put some of the graphs and stuff on the screen but the over over overwhelming majority of the research done on wide receiver switching team was extremely extremely negative and again it goes back to being a common sense thing when you are switching teams, like you have a whole new system to learn. You have other targets that already have, not only do you need to build chemistry with the quarterback, but these guys like the Christian Kirks and Larry Fitzgerald, they already have chemistry with the quarterback. So you're not going to come in and be the number one guy. He will be the number one guy, but he won't have number one elite chemistry with the Kyler Murray like he did with the Deshaun Watson. That stuff takes time. And what's what's most interesting and also makes sense, most of the guys struggled in their first year with a new team, but you see the numbers bounce back up in year two. And that goes to the chemistry story storyline and I think that makes perfect sense right you drop off especially with this summer where we're getting a lot less physical work together because of the coronavirus they're not going to have that time to work on timing and, and building that chemistry and etc cetera, etc cetera, all the fucking buzzwords that you hear about wide receivers switching to new teams so I will link all those articles down below if you want to read more uh, thoroughly into the subject some of them are behind paywalls so I'm not sure if you're going to be able to actually use them without subscriptions to the sites but again guys I've done the research for y'all as I always try to do we cut out the fucking middleman for you the overwhelming majority of research tells you to fade guys moving to new teams DeAndre Hopkins obviously an upper echelon talent I also want to talk about the the offense as a whole it's it's interesting because we look at them and we see Cliff and we're like oh they're a running gun team they're gunslingers but that wasn't the case over the second half of the year like after week 10 on when they acquired Drake they became extremely run heavy they ran the ball at the 10th highest rate of all NML, NFL teams once Drake came over to the Cardinals and from that week on from when Drake was acquired Kyler Murray ranked 27th in pass attempts per game from week 10 through the end of the regular season. They went very, they were not the same team. And I think that's a tribute to Cliff Kingsbury being able to adapt to the offense that he has at hand. Uh, most coaches stick with the game plan that they have pretty much throughout the year. They try to use the personnel the same way that they fit them into fucking square holes, round pegs, whatever the fucking saying is. In the beginning of the year, Cliff was able to adapt, which is which was awesome. As a Cardinals fan, as a I'm not a Cardinals fan, but for those of you that are Cardinals fans out there, you gotta like what you have seen. Here's what I'll leave you with. I'm already back on the D-hop train in 2021. 2020, not gonna be the guy that I pick here. 2021, 
spike on the train. Hopkins is obviously an elite talent, so you can't just write him off and be like, no, he's my wide receiver 12 for the year, but he's not a guy like at the ADP is going. I would not take him above Julio Jones. I would not take him above those running backs that are going in the early uh, early second round. You know, the Josh Jacobs is, the Miles Sanders is, those guys I, I would much prefer the running back over a guy like DeAndre Hopkins. One guy I absolutely love, and he's going fucking, what is it, 15 picks, seven, like 18 picks later than DeAndre Hopkins, which is a fucking travesty. DJ Moore, the Carolina Panthers. He is my wide receiver seven, currently going off the board at the 311 as the wide receiver 11. So I have him four spots higher than consensus right now, and I'm going to I'm gonna break him down pretty, pretty in-depth here. He had his breakout last year, of course, 2019, after a nice rookie season, came out last year, 87 catches, 1,175 receiving yards, four touchdowns, plus 40 rushing yards. So he went over the 1,200 yards from scrimmage mark. If you look at the box scores, it'll, it'll tell you that he played in 15 games, but he really only played in 14 because week 16, as a lot of y'all probably remember who were in your fantasy championships, he left extremely early with a concussion. Extremely impressive stat line for playing in 14 games, but what's more impressive is that he did that with Kyle Allen and Will Greer playing quarterback for the Carolina Panthers and one of the great you know I don't I don't dive into PFF grade or stats too much their grades I should say because I think they're a little bit subjective to whoever's doing the grading at their place but one of the more predictive grades that they do have is the quarterback passing grade that's something that's been sticky year over year and when you look at the 38 qualified quarterbacks from last year Kyle Allen had the 36th lowest grade and or the 36th highest grade so he was third worst in the nfl quarterback passing grade per pff will greer 38 out of 38 so both of them were bottom three in terms of nfl caliber quarterbacks for the pff grading system moore's catchable target rate ranked 74th among wide receivers his target accuracy ranked 72nd lots of changes happening in 2020 though for the carolina panthers they obviously bring in the combination of matt rule from baylor and joe brady from lsu and i've been on record about how much i love joe brady and the signing from lsu i think he's a big reason why we saw guys in that LSU offense absolutely pop the fuck off, right? Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, Joe Burrow, Thaddeus Moss. Like, we had a ton of production in that passing game. You look at the top two wide receivers from last year, Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. We all know the latter because he actually came out this year, got drafted by the Minnesota Vikings. 111 catches last year. In a college season, that's insane. 111 catches, 1,540 yards, 18 touchdowns while competing with arguably the best wide receiver prospect we've seen in years, Jamar Chase. 84 catches. 1,780 yards and 20 motherfucking touchdowns. Let me repeat that for you. 20 mother flipping touchdowns for the kids out there. They also had a third wide receiver, this guy named Terrence Marshall. I don't know who the fuck he is, but he scored 13 touchdowns as well. If there's one thing that's clear to me, it's Brady knows how to use his passing game weapons and Moore is inarguably the best outside weapon this team has and has had for quite some time. The second factor going into DJ Moore's outlook, of course, is that Teddy Bridgewater is coming in. And even if you don't think he's a good passer, he's a he's that much of an upgrade from what they had last year, which he is, uh, he provides much needed stability in the passing game that will be more than just check downs to C-Mac on every single drop back and every time he's pressured. I'm actually really excited to see this team take the reins off of Teddy Bridgewater a little bit and let him throw the ball downfield a little bit. I, I feel like he's been unfairly pigeonholed given the stature that he's just this weak armed game manager quarterback and he, all he does is dink and dunk. And the beauty of this is even if that's true, whatever side of the argument you're on for Teddy B, if you think he's better than he's getting credit for, if you think he's worse than he's getting credit for, it's a good fit for DJ Moore. And I'll explain why in a second. Last year, Teddy Bridgewater's deep ball completion percentage, 46.7%, fourth in the NFL among all quarterbacks. It was a sample size of only the six starting games that he had, but I'd much rather see him with that high completion percentage than without it. His play action completion percentage, second in the NFL, as was his overall accuracy rating per player profiler, second in the NFL, his adjusted yards per attempt, top 12. You've heard the narrative a lot this offseason that Curtis Samuel saw so many uncatchable deep targets. DJ Moore saw a total of 21 deep targets per PFF. So 21 targets down the field. Only six of them were deemed catchable. So only six of them were even in the catch radius. DJ Moore caught all six of them for 218 yards. And I'm not suggesting that Teddy B needs more credit than he's being given, but people need to open up to the idea that Teddy B could actually be a much, much, much bigger upgrade to Kyle. He's not just like a Kyle Allen with a, with a slight upgrade. I think he's Kyle Allen turning up the dials on just about every part of the quarterback game. Deep ball, short accuracy, better decision making. So I think he's a better deep ball passer than we're giving him credit for. So if you are on the argument that he's better than we think, that's great for DJ Moore because now he will have probably double the amount of catchable targets on deep balls. And we saw how effective he was when he got 
just six of them caught all of them on the flip side if if he is just a game manager this is where Moore thrives right we saw Teddy B lock on to Michael Thomas his clear clear number one in that passing offense from his starts week two through seven the six starts that he had Michael Thomas led the NFL with a 32 percent target share 41 percent air yard market share was fifth in the NFL over that span as well Moore on the flip side is obviously the clear clear alpha number one in this offense and we should expect similar treatment to Michael Thomas's numbers maybe not that voluminous love dropping that fucking words on you peasants if dj moore gets the volume which he should he is going to dominate given his yak ability i think people forget like who dj moore is as a prospect and as a player he is well built six foot 210 10 pounds and he's also a damn near elite athlete athletic charts on the, on the right side over there you see 89th percentile pretty much everything and above 40 yard dash weight adjusted speed score burst score agility catch radius those are what makes him so explosive after the catch most missed tackles forced among wide receivers since 2018, since he entered the league. DJ Moore, 30. Michael Thomas is probably up there because he catches so many goddamn passes, but Golden Tate, Odell Beckham, both explosive after the catch. DJ Moore, number one. And lastly, and most, com most importantly, I think, is just the consistency you get with DJ Moore in your lineup. I mean, look at down the stretch last year. The first column is those target numbers, 10, 11, 15, 9, 12, 6, 12. Second column is the catch numbers. Third column, and most impressively, the yardage numbers. Over the last seven games, his worst yardage total was 75 yards, which is crazy. And in the Big Dog Draft Guide, one of the tools that we have available in the draft guide is our consistency charts, which you could see from all of last year. We're looking at who the most consistent players were in fantasy football, the percentage of games that they busted. Shout out to Mason for the help on those. We have five game types when it comes to consistency charts. We have busty, extra medium, cooking, booming, and faded the public. On the right side, you could see the number of fantasy points you would need to have in half PPR in order to fall into each category. The games that are really useful to fantasy players are the cooking, booming, and faded the public. The bottom three. So you're scoring either 12 to 17, 17 to 24, or, 12, or 24 plus. So anything 12 or above falls into those three categories. Among wide receivers last year, Michael Thomas was the only wide receiver to have more games in the cooking, booming, or faded the public categories total than DJ Moore. He was at 12 fantasy points in 10 of his 14 games. Moore caught 87 passes last year in 14 games with horrible quarterback play. Only six of his 21 deep targets were catchable. You talk about a full 16 games. You talk about Teddy B coming in. You're getting over 100 catches with DJ Moore. I, I would be very, very confident in saying that. He's going to catch 50% more, if not 100%, uh, you know, 100x, not 100x, 1, 2, 2x, the number of deep balls that he got last year. I truly, truly believe that DJ Moore's like stat line is going to look something similar to like 100 1550 and seven touchdowns. I think that's extremely attainable for DJ Moore in this offense this year. And now, now I think about it. Now I've done the analysis. I'm probably, I'm not, I'm not saying I would take more. I might take more straight up over DJ, uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Like he might actually move above D hop for me in the rankings. The ADP is like, you would actually be able to get both of them in where they're going in drafts right now, which is absolutely absurd to me. So that's some real time analysis for you. And that's not even to mention that DJ Moore is on the Panthers whose division one is just filled with shootouts year over year. The offenses that they're going to be going against, the Falcons, the Saints, and the Buccaneers are going to be plush scoring scoring and scoring and the Carolina Panthers defense lost like everybody this year no more Keekly no more Bradbury no more fucking anybody they're going to give up points and they're going to score points with Joe Brady DJ Moore is going to enter that top five range of fantasy wide receivers especially in full PPR and standard I might pull back a little bit but I still think he's a phenomenal phenomenal value in the third round so DJ Moore my wide receiver seven if you want all of our rankings all of our dynasty rankings season long rankings that is available as well as the consistency charts I was just talking about in the big dogs draft guide this is something that we put together all summer it's completely updated and live throughout the summer as things change we put new things into it so it's the rankings for all scoring types it is our top sleepers our top busts our must draft players the fucking bible which is a, a round by round strategy a position by position strategy huge article uh exactly how to attack your 2020 fantasy football draft as well as a ton of other exclusive articles and videos that we are adding weekly throughout it is the best purchase you're going to make anything fantasy football related throughout the entire summer so head over to bigdogsdraftguide.com if you're in a state that's eligible to gamble that does FanDuel or DraftKings bigdogsdraftguide.com forward slash mkf monkey knife fight is sponsoring the draft guide this year so forward slash mkf you'll get both guides plus ten dollars to play with on monkey knife fight when you go through there use the promo code bdge when you sign up you'll get the rookie guide the dynasty guide the season long guide twenty dollars to play with on monkey knife fight i love y'all make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed we'll be back thursday with dr morse so stay tuned you bitch <laughs>